The financial press and even the network news shows have begun reporting the price of gold regularly. For 20 years, between 1980 and 2000, the price of gold was rarely mentioned. There was little interest and the price was either falling or remaining steady. Since 2001, however, interest in gold has soared along with its price. With the price now over $600 an ounce, a lot more people are becoming interested in gold as an investment and an economic indicator. Much can be learned by understanding what the rising dollar price of gold means. The rise in gold prices from $250 per ounce in 2001 to over $600 today has drawn investors and speculators into precious metals markets. Though many already have made handsome profits, buying gold per se should not be touted as a good investment. After all, gold earns no interest and it qualifies and its quality never changes. It's static and does not grow as sound investments should. It's more accurate to say that one might invest in a gold or silver mining company where management labor costs, and the nature of new discoveries all play a vital role in determining the quality of the investment and the profits made. Buying gold and holding it is somewhat analogous to converting one's saving into $100 bills and hiding them under the mattress, yet not exactly the same. Both gold and dollars are considered money. Money does not qualify as an investment. There's a big difference between the two, however, since by holding paper money, one loses purchasing power. The purchasing power of commodity money, that is gold, however, goes up if the government devalues the circulating paper currency. Holding gold is protection or insurance against government's proclivity to debase the currency. The purchasing power of gold goes up not because it's a so-called good investment, it goes up in value only because the paper currency goes down in value. In our current situation, that means the dollar. One of the characteristics of commodity money, one that originated uh, naturally in the marketplace, is that it must serve as a store of value. Gold and silver meet the test, paper does not. Because of this profound difference, the incentive and wisdom of holding emergency funds in the form of gold becomes attractive when the official currency is being devalued. It's more attractive than trying to save wealth in the form of a fiat currency, even when earning some nominal interest. The lack of earned interest on gold is not a problem once people realize the purchasing power of their currency is declining faster than the interest rates they might earn. The purchasing power of gold can rise even faster than increases in the cost of living. The point is that most who buy gold do not do so to protect against the, uh, do so to protect against the depreciating currency rather than as an investment in the classical sense. Americans understand this less than citizens of other countries. Some nations have suffered from severe monetary inflation that literally led to the destruction of their national currency. Though our inflation, that is the depreciation of the US dollar, has been insidious, average Americans are unaware of how this occurs. For instance, few Americans know nor seem concerned that the 1913 pre-Federal Reserve dollar is now worth only four cents. Officially, our central bankers and our politicians express no fear that the course on which we are set is fraught with great danger to our economy and to our political system. The belief that money created out of thin air can work economic miracles if only properly managed is pervasive in the District of Columbia. In many ways, we shouldn't be surprised about this trust in such an unsound system. For at least four generations, our government-run universities have systematically preached a monetary doctrine justifying the so-called wisdom of paper money over the foolishness of sound money. Not only that, paper money has worked 
surprisingly well in the past 35 years, the years the world has accepted pure paper money as currency. Alan Greenspan bragged that central bankers in these decades have gained the knowledge necessary to make paper money respond as if it were gold. This, they argue, removes the problem of ob obtaining gold to back the currency and hence frees the politician from the rigid discipline a gold standard imposes. Many central bankers in the last 15 years became so confident they had achieved this milestone that they sold off large hordes of their gold reserves. At other times, they tried to prove that paper works better than gold by artificially propping up the dollar by suppressing the market price of gold. This recent deception failed just as it did in the 1960s when our government tried to hold gold artificially low at $35 an ounce. But since they could not truly repeal the economic laws regarding money, just as many central bankers sold, others bought. It's fascinating that the European central banks sold gold while the Asian central banks bought it over the last several years. Since gold has proven to be the real money of the ages, we see once again a shift in wealth from the west to the east, just as we saw a loss of, industrial, uh, of our industrial base in the same direction. Though Treasury officials deny any U.S. sales or loans of our official gold holdings, no audits, so no one can be certain. The special nature of the dollar as the reserve currency of the world has allowed this game to last longer than it would have otherwise. But the fact that gold has gone from $250 an ounce to over $600 an ounce means there is concern about the future of the dollar. The higher the price of gold, the greater the concern for the dollar. But instead of dwelling on the dollar price of gold, we should be talking about the depreciation of the dollar. In 1934, a dollar was worth one twentieth of an ounce of gold. Twenty dollars bought one ounce. Today, a dollar is worth one six hundredth of an ounce of gold, meaning it takes six hundred dollars to buy one ounce of gold. The number of dollars created by the Federal Reserve and through the fractional reserve banking system is crucial in determining how the market assesses the relationship of the dollar and gold. Though there's a strong correlation, it's not instantaneous or perfectly predictable. There are many variables to consider, but in the long term, the dollar price of gold represents past inflation of the money supply. Equally important, it represents the anticipation of how much new money will be created in the future. This introduces the factor of trust and confidence in our monetary authorities and our politicians. And these days, the American people are casting a vote of no confidence in this regard, and for good reasons. The incentive for central bankers to create new money out of thin air is twofold. One is to practice central planning through the manipulation of interest rates. The second is to monetize the escalating federal debt politicians create and thrive on. Today, no one in Washington believes for a minute that runaway deficits are going to be curtailed. In March alone, the federal government created a historic $85 billion deficit. The current supplemental bill going through Congress has grown from $92 billion to over $106 billion and everyone knows it will not draw President Bush's first veto. Most knowledgeable people therefore assume that inflation of the money supply is not only going to continue, but accelerate. This anticipation plus the fact that many new dollars have been created over the past 15 years that have not yet been fully discounted guarantees the future depreciation of the dollar in terms of gold. There's no single measurement that reveals what the Fed has done in the recent past or tells us exactly what is about to, there, to do in the future. 
Forget about the lip service given to transparency by the new Fed chairman Bernanke. Not only is this administration 